Uh, it's my honor to uh, introduce our fourth speaker. Um, he is uh, Professor uh, Marcus Gerhardt. Uh, Marcus is a Professor of uh, Clinical Microbiology and Immunology at the uh, Technical University of Munich. Uh, he'll be um, briefing us on the findings from the LINQ Helicobacter study. Marcus, please. Yeah, I'm happy to do so. And um, let me start by thanking, <clears throat> thanking the organizers for this wonderful meeting. And, um, of course, the audience for um, still holding through in the last day. Um, so um, I've, I've only three minutes left, so I'll try to, to try to be quick, quick, but not that quick. Um, you might have noticed that um, uh, uh, in the middle of this year, we, we finally managed to conclude a trial that has been ongoing for, um, well, including the preparation phase, 15 years, and to my knowledge, uh, was and still is the, uh, the largest randomized um, trial in, in which Helicobacter um, pylori eradication therapy was uh, performed in order to prevent gastric cancer. Um, and the trial was uh, performed in a risk area um, with a relatively high risk in Shandong province in, uh, in China. And um, we've seen those pictures yesterday, so I'm not going into detail, um, just to, to emphasize uh, why we performed this trial uh, in this specific region, um, uh, because the number needed to treat, we estimated, uh, went um, up to 200,000, so we needed a high-risk area in order to be able to um, uh, to, to really manage this trial, and uh, it was only possible with the huge clinical trial center at the Beijing uh, University. Um, the status, um, and, and that's an important um, point to consider when we started thinking about these trials, was um, 15 years ago, so the first time I traveled to China was 2008 when we initiated this discussion. Um, and was, what was known there was knowledge from quite a number of trials also performed um, in Shandong province, like the CIS trial, but um, all those were relatively small studies, um, and they were not conducted at a real population-based um, uh, uh, approach. Um, and so we, we decided the first... Um, to come as close to real life situation as possible, um, what we needed was a population-based mass eradication trial um, in, in order to see how we could implement um, gastric cancer prevention through this um, eradication measure really at a population-based uh, based level. Um, and um, most of the other studies were only of modest size um, and um, had a number of different treatment regimens that were not really comparable. Um, and, and so we decided to address all those um, uh, parameters in the design of this new trial. And this is just some illustrations from the very first meetings we had um, uh, in the, let me see, can I? So here, for example, you see Professor Kla Meinhard Klaassen, my, my former, former or first chief in gastroenterology um, in, uh, in the 90s. Uh, um, he, he meanwhile um, deceased. And on, on, on the right side, uh, Wei Xing Yu, his uh, collaboration rating partner, the chief of the um, Department of, of um, Epidemiology at the Beijing Cancer, uh, Cancer Hospital. Um, and we aimed at um, including um, 200,000 participants into, into this trial. This is the rough trial design. If you're interested, um, it's, uh, it's in the paper, so you can take a look. Um, and just a few points I want to make here. Um, the first is that the screening involved breath testing. Um, at that time, serology seemed not reliable enough. And um, since other tri trials had been performed in this population, we expect that quite a number of eradicated people. Um, and uh, um, that was only, uh, uh, on, only possible with bringing, um, sort of bringing the breath test uh, to the patients. So they had a team which rode to, to the villages in buses, taking all the machinery and the whole um, uh, infrastructure that was needed for recruitment, um, uh, 20, 30 people of clinical teams uh, going to the villages and re recruiting um, uh, a thousand people, up to a thousand people within a week in, in, in each of the villages. Um, the other important aspect is shown on the right uh, after 
really intense discussion with the ethical committees, we decided that uh, we could not have a pure placebo group. Um, and we provided what is called here a symptom alleviation treatment um, that contained omeprazole and uh, con contained um, uh, and contained bismuth in order to maintain the uh, the blinding. Uh, you, you might know that bismuth. Uh, gives the stool a dark color, so it would have been impossible to provide the omeprazole only. Um, and um, when you look in the data later, you'll see that, uh, to our surprise, the symptom of elevation treatment uh, had uh, already an eradication rate of uh, 15%. Uh, that was relatively high, um, and uh, also one of the fa uh, one of the um, the reasons why the modest we, uh, the effect we observed in the end was was a bit modest. Um, here's the, uh, the crude numbers. Um, so we observed uh, 354 um, gastric cancer uh, cases in the treatment group and 399 in the symptom alleviation uh, group. Um, and also important to point out, there were 280 uh, and 82 gastric cancers in the H. pylori negative group. And that's something we're currently looking into, but that also uh, is a trend we, we've been heard about yesterday that there's more and more people who are helicobacter negative, especially younger women um, with uh, potential autoimmune disease. So I think we need to, um, we, we should not forget that um, beyond helicobacter pylori, more and more other parameters driving gastric carcinogenesis are, uh, are, are coming up. Then, um, this, this is probably the most, uh, uh, the most important um, uh, out, outcome figure showing uh, the difference between uh, the symptom alleviation treatment, so the control group, and the, um, and the real treatment group. Um, and uh, a few points to, to, to note here, also something we've heard yesterday. Um, if you look at the time, it, it's actually a, a, um, a mirror picture from what we saw yesterday that the curves only spread after six, uh, six to eight or seven to, uh, or seven to eight years. Yeah. So it really takes that long for the effect or the treatment to become effective in terms of gastric cancer prevention. It also informs us as gastroenterologists that uh, after eradication, we need to follow our patients for quite a while to make sure that we are not overlooking um, uh, gastric cancer that has already been initiated at the point, uh, time point of, of, of eradication. And when we're thinking about mass screening and mass eradication programs, then that's a considerable burden of endoscopies that are, uh, are, are coming up and still need to be performed for, for quite a number of years. Um, the other interesting uh, per, per parameter or the other reason why the effect size is relatively modest might be the cluster randomization. It was the only way to um, achieve this. Um, cluster randomization here means that um, we had villages with, with av average um, um, population size of one to uh, 5,000, and um, a whole village would receive um, either the real treatment or the, uh, the uh, sort of symptom alleviation treatment. Um, and of course, this a certain leakiness might might occur that people would seek um, uh, uh, medical advice at other places and then learn that they had not been eradicated and that may spread in a village. We actually had a questionnaire in order to try to uh, assess that, compensate uh, that, and we couldn't find any indication, but it is certainly something to, to, to keep in mind. Um, the treatment regimens were different um, for, uh, for for cost purposes. Were different here um, using this uh, metronidazole um, uh, tetracycline um, uh, co combination than in previous trials. That could also account for the relatively low eradication rate, which was uh, around seventy-five percent. Um, so the difference between the, the two treatment regimens um, was not as you, you, would ho you would hope for, but then that's a real, the, the real life study. And I'm, I'm wondering if we, in, in the real, real life situation with very few examples, really re reach the 80% um, 
if, uh, if it's not within control tri uh, control trials. Another important parameter, the relatively short follow-up. Um, so um, if you look at these curves, then um, we, we expect that the differences will become even more significant um, upon further follow-up. And it's important to note that we did not offer secondary treatment because that would have uh, uh, would have meant unblinding of, um, of of the study. So those people who were not eradicated um, have not been eradicated until the end of the trial, um, end of last year. And we're currently now just uh, uh, discussing with several. Um, uh, co companies um, how to make treatment available for those um, uh, yeah, close to 60,000 people who have not been eradicated. Of course, we want to provide them eradication now. Um, <clears throat> yeah, incidence uh, mortality hazard ratios are shown here. Um, again, um, the uh, uh, modest effect of 0.87 um, with, the, with the treatment, but the point I want to make here is that if you look at the difference between successful treatment and failed treatment, then, then it becomes really significant. Um, and this is even more, I'm jumping a bit, um, uh, this is even more um, impressive when you, when, when you look at these curves um, where you can see that uh, the people um, who had uh, su successful treatment are nicely below the control group, but the people who had failed treatment, that's the pinkish curve at the very top, uh, even, even have an increased risk. Um, I'll, I'll come back to, to, the, to that in a minute. Um, another very important factor, because a major concern of the ethical committees in the beginning and in the field, and obviously also the reviewers, was um, are we doing any damage with this treatment? So may any other diseases or cancers come up after um, eradicating Helicobacter in such a large population? And, and at least from a statistical standpoint, the answer is no. Um, importantly, um, you can see esophageal cancer here. There is a slight, seems to be a slight trend towards more esophageal cancer. Um, we think that this is more the increased alertness. Um, we, we have, over the course of this study, done an intensive training of the endoscopy units in the Linchu County Hospital. So when we started the trial, they had one room and one scope. Now their endoscopy department is larger than ours in Munich. Um, so, um, uh, and, and they have excellent endoscopists by, by, by now. Um, so we think um, it's more the increased and better detection of, uh, of cancers that, that we see now in this area as compared to, uh, to, to 15 years ago. But it's certainly one of the parameters we're going to look at in the follow-up very closely um, because that's been a debate that's been ongoing for, for a long time. Um, uh, you may recall this very early, um, I think it was a gut paper from Labens um, claiming that uh, eradication would um, increase gastric ca uh, esophageal cancer risk, and since then it's been refuted by some, but I think we're still not really sure. Um, so it will be another, another important parameter we, we want to look at later on. Um, uh, another important uh, point, which I also will come back later, is here colorectal cancer. Also there, no difference was observed. Um, and as I said, I'm, I'm going back to this in a minute. Um, whom do we treat and when? And that's a question which, uh, which I've heard in many of the talks um, during the last uh, two days. And an important observation here was the, the group that benefited most from the treatment was the, was the age group below 45. Um, and uh, yes, we are, we are looking at a high risk population there, but also um, the populations we've been discussing here um, so Asian Americans, Americans with Asian background, um, uh, we should keep that in mind uh, that the age of performing this treatment or the age of performing our screening procedures um, is, is very important and uh, what works for other cancers might, might be too late here um, and we might have to move to a bit younger patients and that seems also to be the trend we observe that uh, the, uh, the, the cancer rates, the gastric cancer rates seem very stable um, among the younger populations and only decline, decline in, the, in, in the elderly. Yeah, and then this, uh, um, my favorite slide, because I, I, I find it so um, fascinating and puzzling at the same time to see how, to which extent we 
increase the risk um, of cancer if we if eradication fails and we do nothing. Um, and uh, it's been been given rise to a lot of speculation why that might be. We are, we are discussing uh, changes in the microbiome. There were some confounding factors, obviously, which were I've also dis extensively discussed with Paul. Is he here still? No, I think he had to leave for. Oh, anyway, yeah, so, so Paul uh, uh, was thinking this is mostly uh, due, due to confounding factors we've normalized for, for a number, but still the effect is there. So we should keep in mind that with the treatment we are, uh, um, we are messing around a lot with the local microbiome, and we've heard uh, from, from this wonderful paper from, from Yunyu about Streptococcus anginosus. Um, I see other, um, other pathobionts coming up now in the context of Helicobacter pylori. So if we destroy uh, the local niche, uh, then, then other pathogens may take over, and we, we really must make sure um, that the eradication is successful to at least take Helicobacter pylori out of, um, out of the game. Um, the, the, the paper was, uh, was, was, was nicely accepted in, 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 in the media with, with a lot of interesting comments, also interesting comments which, which now stimulated further follow-up and research where we are building on this. I'm not going into detail. And I would like to, in the last two or three minutes, I would like to raise a number of questions in order to more stimulate a discussion um, what, what we can learn from this. Because, I mean, to be fair, the effect we observed was what we hoped for, what sort of was ex what was expected from the smaller from from the smaller trials. So we, it was a bit of a self fulfilling prophecy, luckily. But now, in my eyes, it remains or it leaves us with more questions than um, than answers. And the first one I already mentioned: what's the age? So at which age should we really perform these screening and uh, and eradication procedures? And the ages indeed seem to differ a lot between different countries. Countries. So in Japanese, the recommendation. Correct me if I'm if, if I'm wrong or if it's changed. But I think it's above 50. In Korea, above 40. In China. We assume, at least that's now what we're discussing with the guidelines, um, might, might be um, 45. And for Europe, U, uh, 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 Europe and US, I don't think we have any, any recommendation here in, here, here in place. Um, I mentioned the surveillance after eradication. I think this, this is really important to see if after this treatment we don't pave the way for other um, infectious agents um, main, maintaining the carcinogenic pro, uh, process. Um, endoscopy is a topic on its own. Uh, 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 I mean, what's the better, the, the better screening or prevention procedure? Um, endoscopy can immediately r remove um, Le early lesions, but at the same time, it's an only local effect. And um, if you don't remove the cause, then then you're, you may expect metachronous gastric cancer. Um, eradication therapy is sort of systemic, um, but at the same time, um, you've seen that it takes a long time to take to take effect. So I think we need a very intelligent combination of both, um, and that means um, costs. And the the last point is a bit uh, provocative. Um, where we've discussed it in the last TOGAS meeting in Porto. Um, of course, I don't mean that test and treat is completely obsolete, but test and treat as it was done, meaning testing, treating, and not looking after the patient anymore is obsolete. So we must have surveillance programs even after successful eradication. Um, and just to point out why we think that this is so, uh, so important due to the failed, uh, failed eradication. Um, then um, Helicobacter and other cancers, and there is more and more evidence that Helicobacter is not only causing, uh, causing gastric cancer, and just a glimpse at this um, nice, nice people from, from our colleague Dr. Shaw, you all know about the increased incidence of colorectal cancer. Um, which has been in the literature for quite a long time, but, but this, has, this has been by large the, uh, uh, the best um, uh, study to, to show that. Um, and uh, then our group had um, experimental support which, were, uh, which we provided how Helicobacter in fact does that, and that mechanistically Helicobacter can induce colon cancer through changes in the, in the microbiome in mouse and in men. 
And um, we are currently um, completing a trial in a Chinese region of high colorectal cancer, and there we indeed see that Helicobacter pylori infection is already associated with early adenomas. So it's a very early um, uh, tumor promoter um, in, in, in colorectal cancer. And on top of that, uh, we see that after eradication, um, colon cancer rates are indeed re decreased. So by eradicating Helicobacter pylori, we can not only prevent gastric cancer, but seemingly also colorectal cancer. And in, in Germany and other countries in Europe, we're currently discussing strategies to actually combine colorectal cancer screening with gastric cancer screening. We will never, with those few cases we have in Germany, be able to set up an, an, an independent gastric cancer screening program. So we need other screening programs that are already existing and more or less well accepted um, and uh, use this to piggyback and try to implement helicobacter screening. Um, uh, and gastric cancer screening on those existing programs. And I think that's an important point to discuss how, how really to make that possible and how to um, uh, implement that. And I'd leave you with the last question for the audience. Um, with these increased risks we are observing, um, when we find an adenoma in a, in a, in a colo colorectal cancer screening program, then shouldn't we test all these patients for Helicobacter pylori and afterwards eradicate them? Because otherwise, we also maintain the carcinogenic pro, uh, process in the colon if Helicobacter is still present. I thank you for your attention. Um, many people contributed to this uh, to this trial. They are all listed on, on on the publications, and I'm happy to take questions. Okay, if uh, we can get all the speakers up, Let's shift over. <coughs> we're we're running actually quite a bit behind schedule, so a couple of things. We'll do the panel. This uh, I think this is a very important session. I think there's a lot of questions here, so if you have questions, please come up to the microphones right now. But um, just uh, housekeeping notes: we'll t do the panel discussion up until 12:15, so about 10 minutes. Uh, then we'll take lunch till 12:55. Uh, we will not take a break between sessions three and four, uh, and then um, uh, we do not need to do a group photo. So I promise you we will end on time. Uh, okay, so um, with that, let's go ahead and start with the panel discussion. Uh, question over here. Yes, uh, so a quick question on the, uh, on the AI talk. Uh, thank you for the presentation. It was excellent, eye-opening to see this. Um, the question is about, um, going from a research paper to large-scale deployment. And in the, you know, we usually see first step is publish a paper. Then it would take a lot more work and make it complete in order to be uh, deployed. So I'm just curious in the presentation you had, uh, what would it take to be, to be uh, practical? Uh, yeah, um, thank you very much for your question. Um, the, um, in the United States, so we, don't have any uh, devices available for the AI. And so, um, as I briefly mentioned, so AI need to learn a certain disease. So the current upper AI model is still detect early gastric cancer, but not GIM or atrophy. So uh, there's a couple of questions. One is the, if we can just bring the AI model, which was developed, uh, the AI was uh, AI learned from Japanese people's stomach, that was applicable for our US population. That's the question number one. Number two is um, if that is okay, so we still need to, if that we need to validate uh, to use the device to our population before commercially available. So I think there's a couple of, uh, couple of the, the area we need to improve. Um, and then so speaking about a uh, higher risk screening, so we don't care about advanced cancer because we don't miss advanced cancer. So AI need for detect early cancer. So uh, if we need to develop AI in our country, we need to collect uh, good quality early gastric cancer video and images within the United States. So that is also challenging. So I think we are still discussing how we can move from here. So literature, literature was published in high risk region, China, Japan, Korea, to the US level. 
But even even in Japan and China, uh, these were these models actually deployed in 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 practice. People actually widely using it, or it's just you know it's just at the stage of publishing paper. Uh, to my knowledge, so Japan is uh, is commercially available. So the clinic and then endoscopy clinic and hospital they are currently using AI in real clinical practice. I think that's also true for China as well. Go ahead, Shelja. Thank you. Uh, wonderful session. So congratulations to, to all the speakers. Um, I had several questions, but I'll limit it to, um, to three for, for Dr. Gerhard. Um, you know, we, we clearly saw very nicely the age difference with that cutoff of 45 years old. Um, did you have um, baseline histology in terms of OLGIM scores? Because we know that, you know, with the duration of H. pylori infection, that more severe histology. Um, unfortunately, in this study, we were not able to perform endoscopy at all, not within, within the study. So we, we've, we came up with these questions sort of in the middle of the, uh, of, of the study, and then we um, started a nested trial in which only 20,000 uh, participants are included, screened, and they are all undergoing repetitive endoscopy over the course of 12 years. That's still ongoing. Yeah. But here uh, we we couldn't do any endoscopies. They were done in the uh, in the, at an individual basis when the patients would go seek advice for symptoms. Uh, but we don't have access to these data since it was outside the trial. I see. I see. And kind of um, follow up question. So that that does explain because you had shown very nicely that you know there might be this trend toward esophageal cancer, and maybe it's because of um, training detection. Do you think that? That might, though, also be in those patients who did fail eradication. You're still going to have that effect of improved detection. So we certainly know there are microbiome changes and those aspects, and we've seen that with other studies with antibiotics. But do you think that you know, improved detection might also explain that? Um, we'd have to look into that. It's a very good point. Um, uh, you can imagine that the, the amount of data we have to deal with is huge. So we're okay. still in the, um, all, in the sub-analysis of all these subgroups and, and different parameters. We haven't completed that yet. Yeah. But right. I'll take it back to Beijing and discuss it with them. The consequence of doing a wonderful trial. <laughs> Congratulations. Thanks. John. I'll try to keep, yeah. Um, Juha, you talk a lot about what the purpose is, which is really get people screened, uh, and, or as a screening to then reduce gastric cancer incidence and mortality. One of the big barriers, of course, is payment and reimbursement. One way to, one way to make sure that you get payment re reimbursement is USPSTF grade A or B, and therefore CMS will waive COVID. So all these things are going, the parallels to colon cancer. So here, um, my, my comment is um, we really do need screening studies and I still think we need a screening study in the U.S. And the issue is it's not just uh, randomizing people who have HP, but rather screening for HP. And Dr. Kumar, this is kind of directed to you. You really nicely illustrated all these barriers. It's really not testing screening, but rather testing an invitation to screen. And then you get the whole mess of the adherence part. Um, I was intrigued by your idea that, yeah, actually a lot of things are, require tailoring to be able to increase adherence. Once you start tailoring, though, then you reduce generalizability. So, trying to keep this forward, how are we going to do this? And particularly, you know, maybe this, maybe, you know, can we do this in a quasi-randomized trial where you randomize it by site, and then each site can actually have some tailoring, whether it be a church-based um, uh, outreach or whether it's a, um, I was going to say, you know, in colon cancer and the African American community, it's a barbershop, you know, a focused kind of intervention. That's a Concrete. So I'm just trying to figure out how we're going to address adherence and uptake of screening in a randomized trial of an invitation to screen. That's my overall kind of thought. And that's what I think we need to get if we're ever going to get USPS, TIF, A or B. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think uh, the challenge is real. Um, it, there are parallels to colon cancer screening. And when you think about what Cologuard did, and they opened a 24-7 patient navigation line. You could go to them for financial advice. You could go to them for questions. And, and it was completely available. I think that is lofty for H. pylori, um, mainly because the numbers are, are not as, as large. But I think getting some investment from industry to do something like that would be helpful. 
I do think it needs to be culturally tailored. Um, I was speaking with Dr. Eppeline and we talked about the differences um, in, in our, our area. So um, in Miami, people are really willing to undergo H. pylori screening. Um, usually when they see me in clinic, they, they talk about H. pylori first. When I was in Philadelphia, no one knew what H. pylori was. And I imagine it's, it's something different here. And so part of this is that we do need um, different studies across the country. And I, I don't think what I do in Miami is gonna be applicable to every single um, you know, subgroup. And I think even within, say, Native Americans, there are differences. The Seminoles are a very wealthy, a very well-connected tribe. And if you compare it to um, tribes in Arizona, they have a lot of barriers to cancer care. And so I think it's, it's a really unique challenge. And I think the other thing that makes it more unique is that the, it's a multi-step. Um, and so obviously colonoscopy or, or FIT testing is multi-step. You have to tandem it to something. But for us, it's, it's as you say, it's test and treat. Um, so I'm not sure I, I have great answers, but I, I do think there's um, value in, in behavioral health strategies. I think community engagement is really important. And I think, um, you know, I imagine something like this summit will start to move towards implementation strategies in the near future. Thanks. Lin Zhang, I wanted to ask you a question since you're here. Um, uh, I have two questions for you. One, um, a speaker, uh, 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 an attending yesterday raised an interesting uh, issue uh, regarding South Asians and missing data. And if you look at your graph, the South Asian population has almost an unbelievably low risk of gastric cancer, and we know that they have a high rate of H. pylori. So do you think that, you know, that's falsely low, that we're just not capturing that data? Because, you know, again, Shalda mentioned that, you know, Asians, uh, South Asians have a tendency to go home to die, and so we don't capture any of that information. Uh, and then the second question is why are we, you know, you showed a lot of great data on uh, uh, foreign born and US born, but they're missing for the Koreans and the Vietnamese. So uh, why, why is that data missing? Uh, so the, the, the second question is more simple. So the second <laughs> question, uh, we have to suppress the, any uh, count that's less than a certain number. So we had to hide the number. So that's why those are missing. And then about South Asian data, it's, it's always possible that there, the data may be just false. So that's a possibility. Uh, but the low gastric cancer in South Asians may be true because we see they have very high in, instance of other diseases. Like cardiovascular disease, um, so it is difficult to imagine only cancer registry is not picking up South Asians uh, if they have gastric cancer. All right. With that, um, oh, okay. Back to you. Sorry. I have one question. As the only non-doctor in this room, um, patient advocate here, I want to know what this means. You know, I see all this data. It's interesting. I'm 30, I was, uh, I was 36 when I eradicated H. pylori. I'm now 42. Um, what does this mean? What does this mean for me? What does this mean for uh, patients? Um, what, what does this mean? You want to call? That's a good question. You're the senior one right here. You have more gray hair than I do. <laughs> Uh, I, I, I completely agree. I, I think we, we need lots more um, patient advocacy. Um, and, and I think similarly on our medical and scientific um, um, communities, uh, more efforts in translating the uh, content and messaging into, um, um, in, in, into, into what laymen can easily understand. So lots more efforts are required on that. I, I, I have an answer. Okay. <laughs> I can, I, Okay, thanks so much. And I'm going to, the, the parallel again is colon cancer screening, and it's been alluded to that uh, as part of my role when I was in the AGA, we actually were able to or eliminate cost sharing uh, for the colonoscopy after FIT. Um, and, and it wasn't because a bunch of pointy headed people in academic centers went to Congress. And it turns out we had to talk to CMS, we talked to Department of Labor, we talked to Health and Human Services, and even the uh, treasurer in the IRS, that's who I had to testify with, which is a little nuts, right? But it was because um, we, we worked with the patient advocacy groups, fight CRC. Uh, these are uh, patient families, pa horrible stories, young people dying of colon cancer, and then the American Cancer Society. And the reason they listened to the doctors is because it was the compelling stories 
of the patient advocates. They didn't, we didn't get this passed. We didn't get the co-pays done because of us. We had the data, but it was a compelling story. That's a connection. So I would say, what does it mean? It means that, you know, again, I'm trying to, if we have the data, if we have screening data, we show that in, let's hopefully in the US, that screening can reduce gastric cancer incidence mortality, it'll require congressional kind of a, approval, and that'll become, a, and that is achieved because we have patient advocacy groups like yourself and your groups, as well as, let's say, other organizations like the American Cancer Society, supported but not driven by the data from the science. That's what it means, and that coalition is what's necessary to really actually make an impact and get screening done like we're trying to do in colon cancer. Thanks. follow up on Aki's question. So um, Younghee and I were going to try to organize a, a separate lunch room to discuss uh, follow up advocacy strategies to help uh, folks in the audience to attend, in particular, the Hope for Cancer uh, Advocacy Summit in February. Um, I think because it's such a short time, maybe we can just like, whoever's interested in it, just come to this table right by the, the microphone at lunchtime and we can see if you want to engage and how we can help support you in doing that. Thanks. One quick last comment, Dr. Zhang. Yeah, very quick uh, comment and question. Uh, Dr. Lee, uh, the, the localized uh, stage uh, in Korean uh, American is very high, right? So what is the, one of the reason why the Korean Americans uh, stage is very lower is uh, the the touring to Korea for the health examination. So uh, how's the uh, other countries like the Japanese in the past, uh, is, there, is there a similar uh, phenomenon was there? That's very true, thank you for the comment. <clears throat> and I think <clears throat> there is some miscount of those localized diseases because of the medical tourism. So that will be happen. Uh, the, another thing is, unless they go back to Korea, never come back to U.S., we have a mechanism to pick them up in the cancer registry. But yeah, that's very true. We will lose some people, but many of them will, pick, pick, will be picked up. And when we did uh, the, the survey, interview studies among gastric cancer patients among Koreans, the vast majority of them are actually diagnosed in the United States. So I think the... the so we know that many of them are doing medical tourism and diagnosed in Korea. Maybe those are the relatively younger, healthier before they uh, develop the cancer. The vast majority, oh, sorry, the vast majority of diagnoses uh, were actually made in the United States in the Lake County. Thank you. All right, thank you, everyone. Uh, let's one last applause for the, the speakers. Uh, Again, let's uh, have lunch now and reconvene at 12.55. Thank you very much. <laughs>